Nope. All right, folks, welcome to our live stream. We're really happy to be here on behalf of the Downtown Schenectady and Improvement Corporation. Uh, my name is Mike Diana. I'm the Programs Manager at the Schenectady County Historical Society. And if you're not familiar with who we are or what we do, we are, well, a historical society, a museum that operates in Schenectady. Uh, you can find us at 32 Washington Avenue in the Stockade District of Schenectady. That's where we are right now. You can kind of think of this as our home base. We've been here since the, since the 1950s. This is kind of like our headquarters, but since then we've actually acquired other properties that we're eager to show off. We have another historic property, the Brower House, which is about a block or two that way, again, in the historic Stockade District. And of course, we also have the Maiden Farm historic site just outside of town. A lot of people uh, know us from there. You know, we have a lot of big events and festivals out there. Uh, so that's a pretty popular spot as well. Now, I just want to say before we get started that we were planning on doing a, a stockade tour today uh, of this beautiful historic district outside, but given the weather, it's a little bit windy, it's a little bit wet, we figured that might not be the ideal conditions for a live stream, so we figured we're going to keep things inside today, but we still have a lot of really cool stuff to show off. And we're going to start here in our map gallery. This is where we have, well, several historic maps that we use to orient our understanding of Schenectady history. And there's a lot of history to understand. Uh, a lot of folks don't know this, but Schenectady as a town was first settled all the way back in 1661, uh, making it one of the oldest cities in, in the state of New York, really in, in the whole entire country. Uh, Schenectady is it's, it's pretty old. Uh, and when you talk about Schenectady, how it was founded, it was founded as a small little Dutch trading post. Uh, that is to say, the Dutch West India Company was still in control of what we call New York. Well, they called it the New Netherlands. And Schenectady was one of the last settlements that the Dutch settlers, well, created before the whole province was taken over by the English. So we're really on the far-flung reaches of European colonial society at the intersection of these Dutch and later English settlers uh, on one hand. And then to the West, of course, we had another cultural world Altogether, we had the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee people living to the west of here, and a very vibrant trade is what linked these groups of people together and made the settlement of Schenectady not only possible but well, profitable as well. And if you want to understand that kind of colonial world, it's it's really instructive to take a look at this map right here. Now, this is the Romer map. It is the oldest map of Schenectady that at least uh, has survived to the modern times. If there's an older one, no one really knows of it. This one dates to 1698. And you can see these four blocks of the stockade just as they were settled in 1661. Well, these streets have stayed in the same place ever since. And even until the modern day, you can see this would be Union Street, which stretches today all the way all the way down to Albany. This here would be State Street, right, where the bridge would go over to Scotia here. Proctors would be somewhere over here. And then, of course, we have Church Street, Ferry Street, and what we now call Washington here and Front Street there. Now, these four blocks, so much history to explore uh, within these four blocks. Uh, so we're only going to see a, a small portion of it today, but, but nevertheless. Um, so when this map was created, Snickety was actually recovering from an event that we're going to talk to uh, talk about more a little bit later because this whole colonial period is very sharply divided between the period before 1690 and the period after 1690. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But before 1690, if you're trying to envision, I know we have kind of a rough schematic about what the town would look like. If you want to try to envision it, I think the best illustration we have comes to us from Lentantillo. Now, Lentantillo, if you're not familiar, he is a modern artist. Uh, he paints uh, fantastic historic recreations uh, of cityscapes, landscapes, all kinds of incredible things. And this is his interpretation using all the available evidence of what Schenectady would have looked like prior to 1690. You can see some pretty crucial buildings would be right here. We would have the old Dutch church. Uh, and here we have a, a mill where all of the the, the grains that would be produced in the farmland surrounding the town would be taken there to be to be milled. So you can see the, the kind of architecture, very, very uh, classic colonial Dutch architecture with these steeply pitched roofs right there, all constructed out of 
H-frame timbers. That's something perhaps we'll have to talk about a little bit later. It's hard to get that from the, from the outside. But that is just a little bit of what Schenectady would have looked like in its earliest colonial period. Now, of course, that was, well, more than 300 years ago. If we want to talk about all of Schenectady history, if we want to just briefly touch on the, the, the totality of it all, well, of course, Schenectady uh, really got new life after the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, and it became more of a, an industrial city. But really, Schenectady, I would say, took off in the late 19th century with the rise to prominence of General Electric Company and the American Locomotive Company. And from then, Schenectady would look a little bit something more like this. This is another fascinating map that we have. It's more colorful. I really like this map here. I want to just get a shot of that. So this map was done in 1931, and it shows an industrial city. It shows Schenectady when it was known as the city that lights and hauls the world. And of course, lighting the world referred to General Electric, that massive industrial complex employing up to 40,000 people at any one time. Well, not at any one time, but at its, at its most, 40,000 people. And on the other end of town, we had the American Locomotive Company right here, producing some of the finest locomotives in all of the country and really making a name for Little Schenectady here. And, and this map, it, it really is, uh, it's it's quite comical. There's a lot of cool little uh, uh, details in here. It's not really drawn to scale. It's more of a, I guess, a colloquial map uh, of Schenectady. You can see all these kinds of little uh, interesting anecdotes going on down here. Like we have a, down here in the corner, we have a father and son fishing. And the, uh, the father is saying, hey, you son, you forgot your fishing license. And the son is like, oh, hey, dad, this map is made with artistic license. So you can just kind of see the kind of map that it is. It's, it's, it's a very interesting kind of... Uh, uh, you know, everyday take on what Schenectady would have looked and felt like in its industrial heyday. Now, of course, the, the days of heavy industry were, well, you know, they, they didn't last forever, right? Um, in the kind of the 70s, the production at GE kind of fell off. In the 60s, the American Locomotive Company, unfortunately, well, was shuttered. And Schenectady kind of, well, it had to find a new identity for itself. And you might say we're kind of still in that process uh, of kind of reorienting Schenectady's future. But that's perhaps a, a question... Well, better left to another discussion altogether, because that's, that's a whole nother, uh, it's a whole nother ball of wax, isn't it? Uh, but I want to show you a few of the exhibits that we have that, uh, well, when the, kind of the, the virus is abated, you're welcome to come down and see. So we're going to go to our colonial exhibit, right? We're back where everything started. We're going to go this way. Into this room here. So yes, this is our colonial Schenectady exhibit. There's a lot of very, very fascinating pieces here uh, that get to the material culture of those earliest days. And, and as you can see, the material culture was in many cases quite simplistic, right? You could say this was very rugged frontier living uh, in many respects. Uh, but that's not to say there was, you know, no wealth to be had. In fact, you can see here some finer pieces, some Delft tiles, some very beautiful uh, plates there. Uh, a lot of uh, wealth to be made in the fur trade uh, that was going on at the time. And, you know, there's, there's so much that we could talk about when it comes to this very dynamic period in Schenectady's history. But I do like to just show off a few little anecdotes. Uh, for instance, for instance, we have this gentleman right here. Now, this is Lawrence Vandervogen, and he was a, he's a very interesting character. You see, uh, in 1690, we're going to talk more about this, I can promise, uh, there, was a, there was an attack on Schenectady. There was a, a, a very violent incident known as the Schenectady Massacre, and really the whole town was, was devastated. A lot of people were killed in the massacre, and a lot of people were taken captive, uh, including this gentleman right here. He was taken captive uh, back to Canada back to Canada where he was adopted into a tribe of Native Americans who were well, living up in Canada. Uh, and he became so ingrained in this new home, this, this captive home that he was now a part of, well, he actually just well, started to adopt their mannerisms, their lifestyle. Uh, years after the, the massacre, he was able to come back to Schenectady to well, visit his, his old family and say, hey guys, I know that you haven't seen me since 1690, since that horrible attack. I just wanted to let you know that I'm okay, I'm doing fine, I'm living up in Canada now. And, uh, well, they of course wanted him to stay, they missed him very much, they wanted him to stay, but he had a new home. 
Um, but his, his old family, his Schenectady family, they wanted him to stay so bad that on the night before he was, he was due to leave back for Canada, they snuck into his room. See, Lawrence at this point had adopted a, a native hairstyle with a long braid at the back of his head uh, that was kind of a, a symbol of his, his pride, his, his manhood, right? Uh, so his sister, in the middle of the night, snipped that braid off the back of his head uh, so that when he woke up in the morning, he felt completely embarrassed. He could not go back to Canada, to his uh, Native American home in Canada, and, and face his new family. Uh, and so he resolved to stay in Schenectady until his hair grew back. Uh, well, by the time that his hair grew back and he would have been presentable to his, his, his adopted family, well, he decided that he might as well just stay in Schenectady. So a lot of very interesting kind of changing cultural identities. It's a very common uh, case in Schenectady that people lived somewhere between the European world and the Native American world. It was, it was a, quite an interesting place. But there's only so much that we can see here in this format. I want to bring you over to this painting here. Let's see if we can get a good shot of this. Now, I've been dancing around the subject of the massacre of 1690, and while well, here we're going to address it in full. Now, why was Schenectady attacked in 1690? Well, that is yet another very long story, but to make that story as concise as possible, Schenectady in 1690, uh, even though most of its uh, residents were Dutch, was now part of the British colonial empire, and of course the British colonial empire was very much at odds with the French colonial empire up in Canada. And so, uh, you have the British, you have the French, you also have the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, who are also allied with the British for the most part, and you have this kind of, well, very Games of thrones -y, like balance of power, where each, each faction vied for control of those beaver pelts, those, those humble beaver pelts, which really were quite valuable back then. Uh, so again, to make a very long story short, in an effort to wrest control of the fur trade uh, from the, uh, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, and the English traders of Albany and Schenectady, the French, about 100 Frenchmen and about 80 native Canadian warriors, came down in the middle of a February, cold, cold February, snow was probably four or five feet deep as they walked the, what, 230 miles all the way from Montreal down the Champlain Valley, down through Lake George, down the Hudson River Valley. You see, originally they were going to attack Albany, but the time, by the time they took that long and arduous journey, they were a little bit tired, and so they decided to hit the smaller and less well-defended town of Schenectady. And the attack was a complete surprise, um, and the whole town was really, was really, again, devastated. Most of the buildings were burned to the ground, about 60 people were killed, and about two dozen were taken captive. Uh, and now this painting, it, it's supposed to depict this event, right? It's supposed to be um, kind of a, a look on that, that fateful night in 1690, but you have to understand, this painting was done in 1835. Um, it was done by one Samuel Sexton, who uh, is a, a kind of a, a well-known Schenectady artist, but he probably didn't have the, the best historical understanding of the event. You see, in this painting, you only see Native American warriors doing any attacking, and while there were Native Canadians present in that attacking force, there's none of the French attackers, who actually would have been the majority uh, of the assailants that night. So this is very much an 1835 understanding of what happened in 1690. And I like to think that here in 2020, we can look back at all the evidence and take a more kind of balanced and nuanced approach to what that night would have actually looked like. So while it does capture the brutality, it doesn't really necessarily depict it uh, in a fair way. It kind of lumps all the blame on the Native Americans and, and leaves the French out of it entirely. Now, I think we'll move on to our decorative arts exhibit. So if you want to follow me this way. So this is one of our uh, newest exhibits. Uh, this is a, a gallery that kind of uh, changes uh, from time to time. So it's, it's only here for a limited amount of time. But this is one of my favorite exhibits that, that we've ever done yet. I think it was, it's really well done. Shout out to Susie, our exhibits manager, for, for that one. Uh, so this is uh, handcrafted, uh, the folk and their art. And you can see there's just a whole wide variety of handcrafted artifacts, um, artistic artifacts, here on display. And 
when you go into our collections, you, you, there, there's so much stuff that we have. This is just a fraction, uh, a fraction of all the incredible things that we have in, in our collections. But we, we picked out some of the nicest ones for you. And you can see what, you know, some of these artists were professional artists, but some of them were just average everyday people, uh, farmers or, you know, merchants or anything like that, who, well, were just making, you know, the things that they, they, they needed and they wanted to make them nice, or they were, you know, had some time on their hands to uh, kind of uh, make something purely for art's sake. And again, if I were to tell you the story of every single artifact that we have here, we would go long, long past our time limit. But one thing that I do like to show off, one thing that I think is, I don't know, particularly evocative object, if you want to come this way, we'll get a close-up of these two artifacts right here. Now these are known as funeral samplers, uh, and essentially what's going on here is, well, after the, the death of a loved one, uh, typically uh, women, young women, would make these funeral samplers to try to kind of commemorate their lives and, and express their grief. And you can even see that in the, the messages that are embroidered into the, the cloth here. Um, this one done by one Helen Veter, and she was only 12 years old at the time. And it's, it's kind of grim, but I'll, I'll just read it out for you. Anna Veter died October 30th, 1827, just seven months, 14 days. This pretty babe we had, but now she lies beneath the dust and numbered with the dead. Which is, ooh, that's, that's pretty grim, but I guess that's just, uh, that's just the way things were back then. It was, it was a pretty tough and pretty uh, uh, hard way to live, but that's, again, just one very evocative object. And there's all kinds of incredible things to see here. Uh, so, of course, when things have calmed down and we've gone back to our normal operating hours, we invite you to come on in here and see all that there is to see. But now I would like to go upstairs because there's even more to see upstairs. This is the story of Schenectady in its industrial age, but it focuses not so much on the industry as the people who made that industry possible. That is to say, the waves of immigrants that came to Schenectady in the latter half of the 19th century. Schenectady has always been a place of immigrants, right? New people coming all the time. Even if you think about all those Dutch folk who came back in 1661, well, they were just the first of many waves of immigrants to come to this and make this place their home. Uh, so we have a lot of cool artifacts on, on display here, um, you know, just kind of through the way things are. We do like to kind of show off that, well, immigration has always been a part of our history and, uh, you know, it's, it's always enriched our community. Uh, so a lot of cool things to see here from all the different ethnic groups that have made Schenectady their home. Italian, Polish, Irish, German, Jewish immigrants. Even more recently, we've had immigrants from uh, Guyana. Again, just a constant stream of people coming to this place and, and making it their home, taking some things from home with them, but adapting in their own ways uh, to their new homeland. Now we're going to head to one of my favorite exhibits. And this is something of a permanent exhibit, so this is, this is always here, and well, for good reason. I think this is one of our most impressive artifacts that we have in our collection, and just visually, I think you'll see what I mean. So this is the Yates Dollhouse, and I'll, I'll stand by just for the sense of scale. You know, I'm not the tallest person in the world, but you can see this is a pretty sizable dollhouse. Right? I don't know if uh, any, any kids these days have dollhouses of, of quite this scale. We have a very beautiful side here in the front, but we also have another side over here. And if you think the outside is well detailed and well appointed, check out the inside. This whole structure has been very carefully crafted with very fine furnishings. I mean, geez, you look at some of that furniture. It's nicer than the furniture in my apartment. That might not be saying much, but 
nevertheless, it's true. Now, the story behind this dollhouse, well, it's a long one. This dollhouse was commissioned uh, by one Joseph Yates. Now, Joseph Yates, uh, well, he was the first mayor of Schenectady when Schenectady was incorporated as a city in 1798. He was its first mayor. He was very you know, wealthy, well-to-do man. He was a, a lawyer. When he was not dabbling in politics, he was a lawyer. And, and so he used some of his vast resources to, to have this built. He didn't build it himself. He, he commissioned it, it to be built uh, for his niece. Um, so imagine getting that, you know, as a, as, a, as a birthday gift or as a, as a Christmas present. That must have been just, just incredible. Uh, now, unfortunately, the, the niece didn't live very long. Uh, when she passed away, the house... The dollhouse passed to this little girl right here. Now this is Grace, uh, well, Grace Walton, uh, that was her, her maiden name, and she lived just across the street in a little uh, cream house just across on Washington Avenue there. Um, and well, when she received the, the dollhouse, well, of course, she cherished it very much. So she, she grew up, she grew older, and she, she married, became Grace Watkins. Uh, she kept it uh, for her whole life. She kept it up in her attic. Uh, now, we were very fortunate that, uh, well, uh, it came into our possession so that we could show it off uh, to, uh, well, to new generations of people who can appreciate it. Um, because, man, you really don't see dollhouses made like this anymore. So, uh, we do have a, Mr. Joseph Yates over there. We do have a, a portrait of him as well. You can see him looking very proudly at, right across the way from his dollhouse. You can admire it for all time. There you go. Okay, then you can move on to this exhibit now. Okay, so this is a, another temporary exhibit. It kind of rotates out in this room, but this is again a, a very well done exhibit. This is Changing Downtown, and it really discusses the various physical changes that have come to Schenectady over the, well, the centuries, right? We've kind of talked about how long Schenectady has been, uh, has been here, how much change must have happened over those centuries, uh, and this seems that it kind of details that um, a little bit more. Uh, so there's a lot to see here. We, of course, have this lovely piece right here. If you want to take a look here. So this is from the Mohawk Bank. It was commissioned in 1857. It's a copper building facade. It would go right up there on the top uh, of the bank and kind of, well, you know, serve to attract people. And let me tell you, moving this thing uh, from storage to this location, that is, uh, that's a story in its own right. It's surprisingly heavy and yet also somehow flimsy. And you gotta balance it and, oh man, we, we, had, a, we had a real heck of a day that day moving this thing up here, up those stairs. That's something else. But another one of my favorite pieces is this guy right here. Just came back from a bit of an absence. This is Lopa. Lopa was a macaw, and well, he lived from 1907 all the way to 1936. So he was a pretty old bird. I guess he was 29 years old when he died, if I've done my math correctly. And he was a popular fixture of the, the very popular Nikolaus restaurant. Now, a lot of you might know the Nikolaus restaurant. We do have a an image of it right here. It was on the corner of Erie Boulevard and State Street. It was a German restaurant at a time when kind of German restaurants were a bit of a novelty in Schenectady. Um, so, unfortunately, we have lost the Nikolaus building. It was recently torn down. There was a, a, a bit of a controversy about that, and I'm not really here to make a statement on that, but uh, Lopo was kind of a fixture of that restaurant, and you can see he was taxidermied. Uh, he, he doesn't look that way naturally, trust me, folks. He was taxidermied in such a way. This, this glass uh, case is not for his protection. This is for our protection. He is coated in all kinds of crazy chemicals. I think one of those chemicals is arsenic. You really don't want to touch this guy. We recently tried to get him restored, but uh, I think given the, the process that was used to taxidermy him in the first place, I don't think it's possible. I think he's just going to kind of stay that way uh, forever because, well, I don't want to touch him and I don't think anyone else does either. So that's, that's a little bit of a macaw. You can come and see him for yourself. He's a little bit quieter than he used to be, but uh, perhaps that's for the best. All right, we'll, we'll move along here. So, as you can see, if you were to go up the stairs, there's an employee's only sign. But that's why you're with me. I'm an employee. We can go briefly upstairs. The, this is collection space. 
So there's not really you know, any exhibits upstairs, but we'll just give you a brief kind of behind the curtain look as to what our collection space look like. It's, it's, it's not really a presentation space, it's more of a, a storage space. It's where we keep all of our incredible artifacts. So we'll just take a quick peek at all the crazy cool things that we have to see. Don't tell Susie, our exhibits manager, that I took you up there. It's very secret. So. Very high security, as you can see. Got to keep those squirrels out. Oh, where's the light? Actually, no, there's the light. Thank you. So this is just one of many collection spaces that we have. There's um, several other in this building, and then there's another collection space at the, the Maybe Farm as well. We have thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of artifacts in our collection. And of course, they're all very meticulously uh, recorded in a computer software that makes sure that we know where every single thing is. And all the information that we have for it is recorded, so we have that all at our fingertips when we need it. And you can kind of see all the various things that we have here, I mean, from all different eras, some colonial artifacts, some uh, 20th century artifacts, we run the whole range here. So yeah, again, this is kind of a behind the scenes look. The, the only time you get to see cool stuff like this is, well, maybe if you're a volunteer or maybe on special tours, but uh, we figured we'd do something special since so many of you guys are cooped up at home. We'll, we'll give you the behind the scenes tour. All right, well, we'll head back downstairs, I think. We might be running out of time here. where we started uh, to kind of wrap things up here. Um, again, I want to thank the, uh, the, the Downtown Skanky Improvement Corporation for inviting us to, to do this live stream, and we, we expect to do more of these with them uh, in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and of course, when, again, the, the coronavirus kind of subsides and things start to return back to normal, then we can uh, operate at our normal operating hours. Uh, you know, you're always invited to, to come here because uh, even though this building is, is kind of our home as the historical society, this can, this can be your home too, right? This is a place for the community, uh, for anyone curious about any part of history. Just come and explore. You can become a, a volunteer with us. Uh, you can just come for, for programs. We have all kinds of cool programs uh, to show off this history in unique and, and exciting ways, from, from speaker series to our, well, our, our colonial uh, beverage programs, the, the, the drink seasons as we call them. Those are always fun. Uh, we have programs for all ages as well. We have programs for adults. We have programs for kids, like our ever-popular American Girl Teas. Uh, I, I host those. They're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, I have to say that, but no, no, they're a lot of fun, I, I promise. Uh, but yes, there's always something cool going on here, uh, and we just hope that you were able to see just a little bit of that here today. Again, only a fraction of the things that we have on display uh, could I talk about in just 30 minutes, right? You could spend all day here. I mean, I certainly do spend all day here. Uh, but yes, I, I hope you enjoyed our live stream, and I hope to see you uh, when things start to turn back to normal. Thanks so much, and have a nice day.